the people take notice of any team when they're successful in either a league or a cup competition. And significantly, we won the FA Cup in '64, and that brought the, the focus on the club. And beating Man United in the semi-final, who obviously was the best Lauren Charlton, was a significant step to getting us uh, in the headlines. And so on to that final against Preston. John Sissons for the Hammers, and for Preston, an even younger player, Howard Kendall, only 17, and youngest ever cup finalist. Nobby Lawton, Preston, and West Ham skipper Bobby Moore beat referee Arthur Holland. The official spins the coin, and it's a good start for West Ham. Moore wins the toss. And after nine minutes, Doug Holden puts the ball in the net. We we'll look at it in detail, in slow motion, which is football as it would be if the players had all the time in the world. This is the time for West Ham to pull something out of the bag. A good pass finds John Sissons and it's the equaliser. in the game, West Ham try again, but Jeff Hurst's header is well saved. <laughs> Preston go all out to regain the lead. Standon concedes a corner. Wilson takes the kick. Centre forward, Alec Dawson heads a goal. Preston lead 2-1. Bring on the guard band. West Ham kick off. A goal down, remember. It's a safe bet. They've had a pep talk during the interval. Anyway, they lose no time showing the fighting spirit that got them into the final. Outside right, Peter Braybrook is challenged by Jim Smith. Not quite successfully. A corner for West Ham. Braybrook's kick is just what the Hammers ordered. Centre-half Ken Brown is there, not quite on target. Jeff Hurst does better. And yes, sir, Alan Kelly just fails to keep the ball out. That all happened so quickly. Let's see just how West Ham scored the equaliser. Obviously time for West Ham to go into a huddle. And almost in the last seconds of the game, West Ham inside right, Ronnie Boyce heads into the net. And this is just how it happened. West Ham's third goal, which won them the... Johnny Byrne starts a one-man training session. Bobby Moore, captain of West Ham, captain of England, and at this moment, happy as any man alive, leads his men to receive the trophy and winner's medal. Lord Harwood represents the Queen. A lap of honour now by the 11 excited men who have won the most highly prized sporting trophy in the world. The general verdict, the best final for many a year. them right as their best girls walk out on them.
In the winner's dressing room, you'd expect to see champagne. You have a surprise in store. The drink on the house is milk. If that's their choice, nobody can say they don't thrive on it. This must be the first time the FA Cup has been so misused. Save some for the club, Cat. I do feel that um, the, the game we played against the German side at Wembley in 65 in the Cup Winners' Cup was probably one of the finest games uh, we've seen and, and we played at, at, uh, in, in the Cup Final. Everything we attempted to do and worked out for the past uh, three to four years prior to that sort of, as you say, came off on the night. And it was a wonderful game to play in and a shining example of how the game could be played. It was Wembley's greatest night of the football year, the final of the European Cup Winners' Cup. Munich on the left took the field against West Ham, who won the FA Cup a year ago, and are all out to emulate Spurs' triumph in this competition in 1963. Germans in thousands leavened the mass of West Ham supporters as the big game began, the hammers kicking off. Every Lunder in the 100,000 crowd remembered manager Ron Greenwood's words, getting to Wembley is nothing, the thing is to win there. Brave words, and 11 determined players began on the attack. Munich in white easily survived the early onslaught and went into the attack themselves. Back came the hammers. A pass found inside left ear, but he was offside. A West Ham corner here and a poor clearance gave them a second chance. Munich were rescued from danger by their star goalkeeper, Radenkovic. Neither side had scored at the interval. The visitors kicked off on the resumption and soon showed something of the skill that's brought them fame on the continent. Safe as a rock, Jim Standen was a tower of strength all through the match. West Ham played better and better as the game went on. Another attempt now by Brian Deer, not quite on target. A splendid chance now for West Ham. The ball went to Seeley. And he punched it home. No goal, of course. Now Munich took up the running, but without any luck. Long deferred reward came to the Hammers after 68 minutes. A pass from Boyce went to Seeley. This time it really was a goal. Deer was fouled by the goalkeeper. That meant a free kick for West Ham. Bobby Moore placed the kick well. And Seeley scored again. West Ham was still attacking when the whistle went for full time. What a night for West Ham as Bobby Moore received the trophy from the president of the European Union of Football Association. The whole country is proud of the Hammers, winners of the European Cup Winners' Cup. For more Hurst and Peters, there was to be another cup final victory at Wembley a year later. This time for the biggest prize of them all, the World Cup. The East End greeted this as the ultimate victory for West Ham. Bobby's uh, ball to me in the final from a free kick was a West Ham thing. That understanding between two players, which we, we worked hard under Ron's guide, uh, guidance. Um, so those things were quite significant. So it's uh, yeah, it was significant to provide the captain and two goal scorers in the World Cup final from one club. And the small club, smallest club of that. Lifting the Jules Rimet trophy made Bobby Moore a household name around the world. It was fitting recognition for the Hammer skipper, the rock around which Ron Greenwood had built his Hammers team. Bobby, he was uh, 
um, it was like Pelé. I mean, I, I, I played uh, together with Pelé one year, and he was really maybe the, the best player in the history of, of this game. For me, Bobby Moore was the best defender in the history of this game. He played that way and he lived his life that way. Just hated when he was playing, he hated to tackle anybody and just kick the ball in the stand. If he could intercept, win the ball cleanly and then deliver a ball upfield, that's, that's what he would like to do. And only in desperate situations would he actually clear the ball into touch. And Bobby Moore straight into the referee, knocked out the referee. That really was a powerful header away by Bobby Moore and the referee is completely knocked out. Which in fact has brought cheers all round from the crowd. But that's only funny if it doesn't happen to you. Well, I must admit at the time it was just instinctive. You know, I, I headed this clearance clear and it hit the referee full in the face and he was just lying there in front of me, completely prostrate. And the, uh, the whistle was so tempting that I had to blow it. But uh, there was a slight misunderstanding again. Actually, it was meant to be the final whistle. We were winning at the time, you know. While Moore gave the hammer stability and composure at the back, it was the uncanny partnership between Hurst and Peters that so often won matches for West Ham. I think we trained at it. I mean, it wasn't just happened. You know, we worked at it. You, you don't get anything for nothing. And we would work on the training ground. Um, obviously uh, inspired by Ron Greenwood and what he had to say. I mean, the near post ball, which we developed through Ron Greenwood and Jeff and myself, uh, managed to get away with that quite a few times. Sisson's going outside him on the left. That's the way he plays it. Now Moore coming up in support from behind. Hurst is on the far post. Here's Hurst! Yes, Jeff Hurst! Got Braybrook out there, but he's gaming for the far post. Watch Hurst again! Yes, indeed! Jeff Hurst! Number 10! Jeff Hurst. Could this be his hat trick? Here's Hurst. 3-0. 3 1. 3 1. First hat trick. Redknapp making a lot of speed. Oh, Hurst! Jeff Hurst. There he is. Number four for Jeff Hurst. Number four for West Ham. By now, Greenwood had blooded two new Hammers heroes, destined to play a big role at Upton Park, both on and off the pitch. When I came to the club, there was people like Bondi was here, and uh, and it, the senior players were all very interested in, in trying to improve their game and other people's game and talking about football. And uh, it was a real education to be at the club. And, and plus, we had the best the best coach and uh, the most forward-thinking manager in the country, in Ron Greenwood, a manager who only wanted the best for all his young players. I worked in a supermarket in Green Street in this one summer, loading the shelves. And Ron, Green, Ron Greenwood. He saw me with a white coat on. I went to pick my wages up on a Friday and he said, what are you doing with that? Well, I said, I'm working in a supermarket up the road loading the shoes. He said, you're what? He said, you're playing for West Ham. You can't be doing that. I said, why are you doing that? I said, because you're not paying me enough money to live on. That's why. I said, I'm getting married. I said, I can't afford to get married. So anyway, I think I've got a pay rise. Well, I wonder what Ron Greenwood, the West Ham United manager, there he is on the right, sitting there, never shows his emotion, but he must be thinking all sorts of things at the moment, having seen his side. Give away a two-goal lead. Hurst to Redknapp. Oh, what a goal! Oh, what a fantastic goal by Redknapp! Another Hammers legend starting to make an impression was a young 20-year-old called Trevor Brooking. Indirect free kick. Brooking! Oh, what a great stop! What a good stop! What a good shot by Brooking! In that 68-69 season, West Ham finished in eighth position. Succeeded in doing so. Peters again! Oh, 
superb goal by Peters. 